Okay, so last time we talked about mitigation and adaptation. What was mitigation again? Which is really about avoiding or reducing greenhouse gases to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So try to also uh, limit a little bit the, the climate changes. And then we had the adaptation. What was the adaptation? Acceptance of changes. Basically, you accept yeah, that there are changes, but then as soon as you accept it, what do you have to do? But you're trying to change the situation. Mitigation tries to change the situation. Adaptation, you're trying to lower your vulnerability, but not by changing the situation, sort of by going with the flow, right? You can think about it as being caught in a river. Um, you don't want to get swept downstream. That's the effects you're trying to mitigate. So you can either try and hang on and stay where you are. That would be find a rock and hang on. That would be mitigation. Go with the flow and swim towards the bank. That would be adaptation. You know the current is going, so you're going with it and trying to adjust. Right? Does that make sense, that visualization? Okay. Good. And so we, we talked also a little bit about mitigation and the like options for to mitigate and as it's focusing basically on uh, reducing or by avoiding putting new greenhouse gas into the atmosphere I would say mitigation options they are rather straightforward uh, we said we could move from burning fossil fuels to more renewable energy use for example but when you think about adaptation it's a little bit more challenging because you, I mean, as Eddie said, you try to go with the flow, but you also don't really know, okay, when does the next storm come where I have to maneuver a little bit and get out of this storm, out of the direction of the storm. So you actually, with adaptation, you try to prepare also for future risks. And the future, I mean, we cannot fully predict our future. Yeah, there's always uncertainty behind predicting our future. That's why I would like to talk a little bit about climate change also as a management challenge, because on the one hand, there are problems we are facing today. Yeah, also not really all of them are related to uh, climate change. But at the same time, we have to look also into the future and think about how we can actually prepare for this risk to come. Yeah, for example, here when we work with the local communities here in Kyrgyzstan, they have uh, millions of sheep running around, yeah, and they are really dependent on these ecosystems around them, also on the sheep. And they think with these sheep they can solve their today's problems. But when you look more in the future, and already now these sheets are highly degrading the ecosystems and then when you put climate change impacts on top probably in the future when we look into the future it's not wise to focus only on uh, the sheets if you have these sheets if that happens and I'm not ready I don't have the people to respond I don't have the things prepared to be able to respond with I don't know where people are, I don't know who's hurt, I don't know who's living in what area. I can't actually respond effectively. All of that planning, how do you respond to something that happens, needs to be done in advance. I need to know where people live, who's living in what houses, what resources I have, who's going to go in and save it, who the organization is, where the money's going to come from. I need to know all of that before the event happens. And it's the same thing with these things with climate change. But the problem is, Humans are really, really bad at thinking long term, which is why uh, what Paul is saying is we know these glaciers are melting, we can see it, but they're not gone yet. So we aren't doing anything, and that's the problem because we need to start planning now. How many of you plan in advance, right? You know you have a major assignment due at the end of the semester. Your teacher might even have given you the instructions. How many of you start working on it before the week before? Pretty much no one. Right? No one does that. Because it's not an issue, it's not a concern. We have other things we're worried about that are more immediate. Right? So we deal with all of the other little things before we deal with this really big one. 
And the really big problem with climate change is changing that attitude. If we want to mitigate, we need to do it now. But even more, if we want to adapt to what's coming in the future, we need to start thinking about it now. And that's the big problem, because we don't like doing that as humans. And that's why, even though we should use them, we have to keep in mind that every time projections we have also inherits this uncertainty. That we cannot be 100% sure. And this is basically because our the system, yeah, the Earth climate system we are living in, is very complex. And we have basically still a limited understanding of the system. And we cannot represent in a model like all these connections and feedback loops and so on. So there's always uncertainty inherited in this kind of projections. Still, and I will also come to this, still we have to use them. And I also show you one example um, how actually to use this and also consider this uncertainty in planning. So when we think about climate projections, there are certain things we have to keep in mind. And what I already said, so they give up, they give us like rough estimates for the future. Because where do climate projections come from? And you remember this, this figure where I showed you the trend for the temperature? It was actually two different um, graphs because there were different emission scenarios. When we think about the future and think about how much greenhouse gases we emit to the atmosphere, there were actually assumptions, okay, we could continue like this, then we will go into this direction, yeah, there will be a rapid increase of uh, global temperature, but there are also scenarios where we think, okay, we put a lot of effort now in mitigation options and we try to reduce our um, emissions of greenhouse gases and then we can live with the, with the, um, the increase in temperature. So this basically, you have global emission scenarios, so how much greenhouse gas we put into the atmosphere in the future and how fast. And they actually, based on this uh, IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there are, I think, roughly one to four scenarios. And then you take what is called the general circulation model. And this is basically the figure I showed you before. Yeah? It tries to represent this Earth's climate system. Yeah? It's a mathematical represent representation of how the climate works, connected to our Earth climate system. Also atmospheric circulation and so on. Very uh, sophisticated. And they actually can choose also between a lot of these, depending on the parameters you would like to get out or you want to put in. And then the sum more or less of these two, so it's very simplified now, this is then your climate change projection you get. So a rough estimate for the future of how the climate could look like in the future. And when you Consider all these options you can choose. Wait, this is now a little bit overexcited, but you can get a gazillion possible futures. So basically, when you have, when you take these climate models, and you always have your your baseline you're referring to, and then assume it is today, and then basically. When you take different models, basically from every model you can also get a different output. So you look at the same time period, and you have model A says, when we assume now this is the temperature, there's a really significant temper temperature increase, more medium model C say, C OK is slightly temperature increase. Is that understandable? No. So this is what I meant, there's always uncertainty associated because different models give different projections. 
And this is also when you get the time projections. And for example, we also got time projections for our um, pilot region where we are working with our project. And you have, and you should use them also for planning, looking into the future. And you get different outputs from different models. For example, there might be that one model says, okay, for this specific region, there might be an increase in precipitation by 25%. Another model says, might be even a decrease in precipitation by 25%. And normally, when you get also then um, the output of all, all these projections, most of them they will give you then an average. And when you take the average of plus 25%, minus 25%, what is the average? Zero. Zero. So actually, when you would get this projection, and you should use it for planning with your community, preparing them for the future, and you get only the average, you would say, okay, there's no change in precipitation. But actually, there could be this range that in this region there could be an increase in precipitation, or there could be even a decrease in precipitation. And this uncertainty you also have to consider in your planning for the future. So here's an example from our, from our village we are working. It's in Tajikistan. It's called Ziponch. It's in the Pamir, in the high mountainous areas. And these are our projections for temperature. Here you see the in annual average, but also for different seasons. This is the baseline we had, and this is the um, time period when we looked um, how temperature will change. And here you also see the, the range of outputs we got. So, for example, annual average, there were models saying, okay, there's an increase in precipitation of plus 0 0.9 degrees. But there were also models who said those could be even 1.9 degrees. And what is more, what is easier in terms of temperature is that basically all projections agreed, so to say, that there will be an increase in temperature. With precipitation, again, it's very diverse. When you look at the different seasons, there's basically often this, so to say, disagreement over different models. It might be a decrease or it might be even an increase in precipitation. And another thing is what is really important to consider when you look at time projections. That is that they, I mean, they always show averages, not the extremes. Depending, of course, on the data you have, there are also models, I think, who can uh, predict also um, more extreme days or extreme weather events, but in our case not, and also the, most of them cannot do. And this is when you remember that, I mean, or we personally, we also experience climate change more through extreme events. We do not really feel like, okay, this year I felt there was an average increase of 1.5 degrees over the whole year. No, we feel like, okay, in June there was, again, crazy snow, even though it's not normal in some days. We feel actually these extremes. And this is then also what we should consider when we look at these at these figures, of course it shows like an increase in temperature, but it's not that it's getting nicely gradually warmer. Yeah? For example, I remember that we had in Germany, I think in the, in the state of Bavaria, there was one politician who said, when there's global warming, it's actually nice, and we have soon palm trees in Bavaria, we can go uh, swimming the whole year. And they're also related to, to precipitation. 
Yeah? I mean, even if we say okay in the spring, for example, or in the summer, there might be an increase in precipitation. It doesn't mean that over the whole season there might be a nice uh, distribution of more precipitation. It could also be that this more precipitation comes down in one day as a heavy precipitation event. Then you cannot really um, use it, for example, or even destroy it. And this also, for example, we talked about also um, climate change related hazards, the natural hazards, so this is the case here also in Tajikistan, where we said, okay, the people are highly dependent on glaciers and they start to melt now. It doesn't mean that now gradually water comes down and people can use it and maybe it's more beneficial also for agricultural activities. It could also be that in combination with drought events, yeah, that there's a very abrupt melting and then a lot of water is coming down as flash flood or as mud flow and then the people cannot use it for agricultural activities. So even if there might be a change in a direction where you first think, okay, this might be very beneficial, keep in mind that this apparently beneficial situation might be also a bad situation. And the last thing is, because I do not want to um, yeah, this encourage you now to, uh, to use this because there's so much uncertainty behind, but still use the results, but appropriately. And I just want to show you one example how you could actually do it. Because in the end, also when we work with the local communities, we produce fire projections for our villages and use them for planning, but properly, appropriately. And not if it is a uh, guy from the village that he says looks great, but what's going to happen to my cat? So, how to deal with this uncertainty and how to consider it in uh, planning? And yeah, when we start planning, in this case, especially for climate change adaptation, we have to ask yourself before planning two questions. So how certain are we that this will happen and can we control the situation? So level of uncertainty and level of control action. In our case it was okay what is certain is that the average temperature will increase. We also can be certain that population will continue to grow and how much budget we have, so to say, for the year. What is uncertain is rainfall amounts and timing in the future, when and where extreme events will occur, what's in general economic growth, and the budget for the future. And then when we look at, con at the control level, we can control more or less how much budget we can spend. But again, basically this coincides rainfall amounts and timing, when and where extreme events, and so on. So we have a high level of uncertainty and actually a low level of control. And then we use something which is called uh, scenario planning. And scenario planning yeah, supports in situations, what I said, yeah, with high levels of uncertainty and low level of control. You can actually combine axes of possible changes. This means, very simplified now, okay, we have this possible axis of changes, so especially in precipitation, could be less precipitation, could be more precipitation, just one x x of change. Or it can get slightly warmer and can get really warm. And then what we did is that you just put basically these two axes on top of each other that you have across and then you have actually you can have what is called in these different scenarios you can have one scenario in which you have 
more precipitation and it's getting really warmer or more precipitation slightly warmer and so on and then you can of course give them also funny names like when it's getting really warmer and less precipitation dry roasted and then what you actually can do is that for these different scenarios for example getting really warmer and less precipitation you identify basically what are also the threats there so in this scenario there could be based on these conditions more frequent forest fires for example or when it's getting really warmer and more precipitation we call it a wet hot mess so increased soil erosion, for example, and so on. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. And then we actually build these different scenarios, and then we started to plan so to say adaptation measures for all these different scenarios because with the scenarios you can really plan for these different ones and identify the overlaps and of course also identify strategies which will not work in multiple scenarios so in short it helps us actually to manage this uncertainty we are facing Yes, now it's a bit of a, of a cut because now I want to show you shortly also the specific adaptation approach which actually combines a lot of aspects we already talked about because basically when we think about climate change adaptation most of the time actually we want to help or try to help the people to adapt to climate change. And then, what I just uh, told you is that it's really important to consider climate change information because when you talk about adaptation of climate change and you want to plan something for the future or when you start the process how to better prepare you should be actually aware how the future might change. And then, this is especially important for um, also regions of like Central Asia where the people are highly dependent on natural ecosystems, their yeah, ecosystem services, then we can look also how actually nature can be uh, used also to help people better adapt to climate change. So what is ecosystem-based adaptation? There is a definition um, developed and adopted by the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's a very long one. It's called ecosystem based adaptation, is the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services as part of an overall adaptation strategy to help people adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. It's a very long one, and I just take out now like three key messages out of this definition that you better understand this. And the third one is really that in the center are the people. And this approach wants to help people adapt to climate change. So this approach always begins with identifying also the, the vulnerabilities yeah, of the people in a changing climate. And then you basically ask how ecosystems can help to meet also these needs. Because you first look at yeah, how ecosystems can help, so this is actually the second part of this definition, it's about the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services to help people adapt. And related to this, there's actually a second, I'll here just some examples, 
So how can actually the nature help people to adapt? So you can actually focus on using wetlands in um, also in floodplain areas, but also the ecosystems themselves. So the second key message is that EBA ecosystem-based adaptation only succeeds when also nature itself is able to adapt. What does it actually mean? It's a bit in the direction of uh, going with the flow, what also Ellie said in the beginning. I mean, there are a lot of efforts that we try to also conserve nature or try to protect something which has been there before. But this is often, for example, when you focus on a different, uh, on, a, on a specific um, species, yeah, like a forest, like a tree species in a specific forest, and it has been, for example, deforestated. And then your first reaction is, of course, I would like to reforest it. And when you look at then future trends, it might be that this specific species, which has been there before, might not survive anymore in this changing climate. So reforestation is good. The initial idea, but maybe you consider other, a more drought resistant. Yeah, to rehabilitate the specific ecosystem. We also should try, of course, this is uh, a big challenge, but we should also try to facilitate this change and promote and maintain also flexibility in the ecosystems you are using, or try to use to help people. Do. But of course, with this, we first put a lot of pressure on our nature, and that nature can also solve everything. And of course, in many cases, it's not possible to also reduce the vulnerability of people when you only say, okay, we have to strengthen the ecosystem. So for example, when, especially the communities also in the high mountainous areas in Tajikistan, uh, where you have a lot of landslides and avalanches, maybe it's not enough there to only plant some trees along the slope, and then you can ensure there will be no more uh, landslides and avalanches. That's why this approach also says that taking into consideration these more nature-based solutions should be part of an overall adaptation strategy. So it's totally fine also to combine with other approaches. Yeah, so for example, even though we don't use nature, so to say, in the sense, uh, you use strip irrigation for agricultural activities, or you even build here a dam to um, um, prevent flooding uh, in the, the lowland area. As long as it fits in this whole uh, adaptation strategy and it doesn't put harm also on nature, then it's totally fine. from the today's session, there are several key messages I want you to take home. And so even though there are many uncertainties inherent in this kind of objections, integrating climate information is actually key for any adaptation planning. And when you consider these uncertainties and also make scenarios out of it, then a re-adaptation activity actually must be also robust to most of these scenarios, which could happen in the future. And even though I talked a lot about uncertainties today, do not get overwhelmed about all this uncertainty, because managing uncertainty is possible. And yeah, there's no way around it. Climate change impacts are really, actually we have to do something, we have to do 